so honored today to have with us Scott Frisch from AARP, EVP, and COO. Scott, welcome. George, good to see you again. Always great to see you, Scott. And, you know, what an incredible time to have you on the show during what is a global pandemic. What What is AARP doing to help people during this time? Well, you know, it has been a devastating, uh, this pandemic has had a devastating effect on all of us, especially older people. Uh, so many have died, um, but there's also been the destructive uh, effect of our on health and financial security for, our, for many of us. Um, and AARP has been, you know, the role we've been playing is doing what we always do. We're a trusted resource and a strong champion for people in need. And we've been, um, you know, providing information on caregiving and improvements in nursing homes, making it easier for people to get stimulus checks, um, um, invoking community connections to combat social isolation. But it's been it's been a difficult time for all of us. And, you know, here at ARP, we're doing uh, everything we can to help make things a little bit easier. You know, Scott, what I love about what you just said is exactly that. You are the trusted source of information. As a member myself of AARP, I can tell you, I, I view AARP in exactly that manner, that you are the trusted source for all of this information during this really unprecedented time where the world, the entire planet, perhaps for the first time in history, is experiencing the same exact thing, right? right? In every corner of the world. You, 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 I, we talk to people all over the world with interviews and they're experiencing exactly the same thing with this pandemic. And so during this time, so many people are hurting and impacted, obviously. Um, what do you see as AARP's role? I know a lot of people turn to AARP. What would you see that key role being? Well, I think, again, it comes down to what we've been doing for the last 60 years. We are a trusted resource uh, to provide information, education, and content to our uh, members and society as a whole, especially those that are over the age of 50. Uh, you know, our, our ability to act as a convener to bring people to the table to talk about these issues, to communicate what's happening, uh, I think has been an extremely uh, um, important role that ARP has paid over, played over the last, you know, whatever it is, 11, 12 weeks. I think the days start to run into one another nowadays. That's right. And, and what's remarkable, personally and professionally, and looking at what ARP is doing is that you pivoted so quickly because you have been a convener. And it's not a new thing. It's not like you just started connecting and partnering with other organizations. And the fact that you're that trusted source of information and leadership is not by accident either. I mean, this is all part of the organizational mission, right? To help these vulnerable populations that you're so focused on assisting so that we all have the most updated uh, data and guidance, et cetera, in a way that makes sense. Um, you didn't know this was coming. So how have you been able to position yourself? Well, I, you know, position ourselves in terms of this entire pandemic, I, I'd say it's, I can wrap it up pretty simply. Um, you know, our mission is to empower people to choose how they live as they age. <clears throat> so if you think about it in that term, that those terms, um, being that trusted resource <clears throat> has um, is exactly what we do. And we've been doing it for so long. And, you know, the fortunate, um, the, we're in a fortunate position. We've been able to continue to do this and provide this information and bring people together um, during this pandemic while we've all been in a remote um, status for the last 11 or 12 weeks. That's right. And and so what lessons can be drawn from this, Scott? What can we actually learn from all of this? Well, you know, let, let's talk about, um, let's talk, let's focus on the remote work for a second. Um, because I think, you know, along with many other things in this pandemic, this will potentially change society. <clears throat> and, you know, it's very difficult to sit here and predict the future. Anybody that can usually gets it wrong or tries to usually gets it wrong. I'm not necessarily going to say I have all the answers here, but it does beg the question about what does uh, life look like when this is over or when there's a vaccine or if there isn't a vaccine. Um, but, you know, getting to the remote 
status and you and I doing this remotely here, um, you know, working remotely is one issue. Uh, second is as it relates to the employer, it really reinforces our ability to have a flexible work environment. Um, and we've been doing that at ARP in a number of ways. One thing that we're most proud of is we, we launched a caregiving leave um, benefit, I want to say a year and a half to two years ago, where we give every employer, every employee 80 hours of paid caregiving leave. Combined with our traditional flexible work arrangements around telecommute, telework, phasing retirement, et cetera, that has been very important for us to, to migrate uh, and to allow us to continue to serve our social mission during this pandemic and while we're on a remote basis. Incredible. And that that's something that, again, you know, with leadership, with your leadership and that of Joanne Jenkins' leadership as CEO of the organization, you all have been preparing as if for any anything to maintain that continu continuity, right? Correct. So, you know, I'd like to say over, over the last three or four years, we've made a very concerted effort to build our build a uh, what we call the ARP preparedness function, which is really business continuity, to allow ourselves to prepare for a variety of events, whether it's the hurricanes that hit our offices in one of our state locations, snowstorms, you know, any weather event, earthquakes, and um, I guess in a for a global pandemic, which I must say we didn't exactly have on our list of things to consider, but all the steps that we put in place uh, to build up for these events has allowed us to pivot, go to a remote work site location or work uh, remote working uh, environment and utilizing some of our offsite business continuity areas where it was allowed, really has allowed us to continue to function as is. And we have not seen a, a drop off in productivity at all. So um, it definitely has reinforced the ability or reinforced the notion that you need to be prepared. You need to think about what these events mean what does your infrastructure need to take to be able to handle thousands of concurrent users at once? What are all those backup procedures that people talk about? So they, you know, we have a, a book on the shelf that says, here's our plan, but you have to test the plan to make sure it works and you have to continue to learn from those tests. So when an event like this happens, and hopefully this is a once in a lifetime or once in every hundred year event, um, the organization can continue to function as is. And we've been, thankfully uh been able to do so without a hitch that's right and it and it didn't happen by accident that you were prepared because as you said you've been preparing for several years now for continuity of operations which is a fundamental component that really any organization or business should have and there's certain elements of that that we can all learn from right in terms of partnerships and being able to pivot with partnerships that were created pre-pandemic they now count on to say, I know the capacity of this other organization, company, NGO, public sector, et cetera. We can partner, we can take advantage of that to work together, et cetera, in ways that are not being created now, which is much more difficult, right, to create new partnerships at this moment. Um, so that that foresight, that strategic foresight that you all have, have uh, you know, embodied in your mission is to be commended. And so I'd like to ask you about older workers in a bit in, in technology. What, what are some of these stereotypes that you've seen and the myths associated with those? Well, it's a, a subject that we're very familiar with. And, um, you know, let's let's talk about pre-pandemic for a second. So the myths, um, you know, the myths of the older worker being someone that doesn't handle technology well or they're are too expensive to hire or they're too costly to retain or they, they you know they're out of touch i think before the print pandemic those were um unf I, I i guess i can say it. those those were receding um they weren't gone um, but if you if you specifically look at the technology aspect and i would say this is a if there is any silver lining and there's a there are a few silver linings in this pandemic but one is I'd like to think that the digital uh, skills gap or the age-based digital skills gap, better said, has shrunk because of this pandemic, because technology is now everywhere. Everybody's using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or, or Skype or 
FaceTiming your relatives or FaceTiming your kids or FaceTiming your friends for a Friday afternoon or Saturday afternoon uh, get together. I, I think it's become so ubiquitous, the stigmatism around the older adult not being able to handle technology has significantly shrunk. And I think we'll continue to do so. And, and I've always said that today's 60 year old uh, understands and treats technology vastly different than the 60 year old of 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just like 20 years from now, that technology gap for that 60 or that 50 or that 70 year old will be vastly different than what it is today. Um, so I think that's one big thing is around the technology gap and, the, and how it's been receding. I think the other thing that's being, um, you know, come into play here is one of the, some of the things that older workers do is that they bring a level of institutional knowledge and experience and perspective. Um, and again, this is not just for older workers, but it is, our research shows that they bring a certain level of, of perspective and experience to situations. And having gone through other major events, whether it was 9-11, whether it was the 08, 09 crisis, um, you know, add this to the list. That level of experience um, and perspective has been valuable during this entire uh, pandemic. And the last point I'd like to add, I know I'm getting a little long here, but the last point I'd like to add that ties to that is the value of mentorships um, between the older worker and a younger worker, whether it's, a, you know, and it goes both ways, but that mentorship, especially in times like now where there's a high level of anxiety, it's a high level of discomfort, nervousness. Those are invaluable traits that the older worker brings to the workforce. That's right. And, and what you're doing is highlighting the fact that these older workers are actually more astute in technology in so many areas than perhaps even some younger folks. And there's, there's not that imbalance or that, that, that uh, inability to work with technology to effectively uh, navigate all of these different mediums, like you said. And that really drives us into my next question, which relates to employer flexibility. Mm. God, why, why is that important? We're all seeing and we're all sort of working in different modes. Some are in the office, some are not, most are not. What, how, how can we you know, look at the employer flexibility piece and what's some advice you can provide on that? Well, I, you know, as I said earlier, the, the flexibility around your telework policies um, is, is very important. I think what this pandemic has done is brought to the forefront uh, the point that you can be productive working remotely. Um, you can be productive not being in the office. You know, I was on a call the other day with uh, a woman from the New America Foundation that had said that remote working uh, I'm going to hopefully get this pretty accurate. The remote uh, working concept was really for the mummy track, you know, for the for the women that became mothers, and and that was the way they would um, that was that was the way they'd be communicating within the in the workforce. That's not the case with this. I mean, I think this has proven that we all can do things remotely. Now, it's also, I believe, forced companies to rethink uh, many things, commercial real estate. You know, what is their policy around who can work from home? Can you have a function that can be permanently work, working from home? It's difficult to make these types of decisions while you're in the middle of a, of a crisis, but it does force organizations to really rethink what it means to have a flexible workforce. That's right. And, and you know, going back to older workers, can you talk a little bit about soft skills? Tell us a little bit about your perspective on that. And what about age discrimination? Well, you know, I think the telework really enforces, its concept of telework really enforces the need for these soft skills like problem solving or collaboration and teamwork. Um, and those are traits that, that the older worker does bring to the table. Um, and it's been sharpened through years of experience. So I, I think it's extremely important. Um, and again, touching on the mentorship, men mentee relationship in this environment of, of, of anxiety, having those relationships, having those soft skills to be able to interact with people person and face to face translates, if not equally, or even more important when you're on a telework basis. Um, having said that, you know, you brought up age discrimination, age discrimination, um, while illegal, 
unfortunately still exists in the workplace. Um, you know, it's funny. It's one of those only those few things that people can make fun of and, and not be in trouble for. And that's why we've, you know, under our CEO's direction, this concept of disrupt aging, which is basically changing the conversation of what it means in this country to age, not only in this country, in fact, going abroad as well. Um, but age discrimination is unfortunately still alive and well. I think there was a survey that we did in 2017 that said, more than six in 10 older workers are reported senior experiencing age discrimination on the job. And it's, you know, it's difficult. It's not like someone's going to stand up on top of their desk and shout age discrimination. It comes in many other subtle ways. Um, and then, you know, for those that uh, unfortunately lose their job, the older worker takes ex uh, exponentially longer to be rehired and usually it's at a reduced uh, level of earnings. I think nine in 10 older workers say their, their job after they've been let go is usually less than what they made prior to that. Um, now, the good news is prior to the pandemic, the unemployment rate for the older worker, I wanna say it was about 3.9%. Um, so that that is a good thing in the sense that more older workers are in the workforce, it's becoming more normal, uh, people are getting used to it. Um, combine that with Hopefully, this technology, uh, age-based technology divide shrinking, um, maybe those are two impetuses for age discrimination to begin to be uh, eliminated once and for all. Well, thanks to your work, I'm sure that's the case, and, and it will happen uh, because of the hard work and ongoing efforts of AARP, for sure, and shifting back to working from home. Um, what, Scott, do you see as some of the downsides to working from home? Well, I, I think it's, um, you know, there's, there's a few of them. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, human beings are social creatures. And there's that level of interaction that you need to be in person. And it's great you and I sitting here across uh, two computer screens and we can still interact, but it's not the same as, as though you and I were sitting in person and getting that social connection. Um, so, you know, ensuring that we have that social connection uh, is really important. And a lot of older workers, especially use for those that, you know, that are working either because they have to or because they want to. Um, a lot of them, a lot of us use the workforce as a means to get that social interaction. And because social isolation is an issue, is a big issue, especially as you get older. So if you lose that you know, degree or a certain element of that social connection from the workforce, um, that's difficult. I mean, that that's a big hole for people, very big hole. That's right. And and then how do you keep, you, so you and I, we've met, uh, you know, I, I know you, so it's a little bit easier to conduct an interview because we've had the opportunity to meet in person, et cetera. But how do you keep relationships strong in a remote environment? Well, I mean, it, it's not easy, but I, what it takes, in some ways, it's no different than what it is in the in the in-person environment. It takes an effort. Yep. You have to be able to pick up the phone and, and call or, or send an email or a text. How you doing? How how, how are you feeling? It's not just, hey, I need something, but it, it's it's that human connection. It's no different in work or your family or friends. You need to be able to pick up the phone and, hey, George, how's things going? You know, how's the family? How's business going? doesn't have to have any agenda other than just checking in on people. And I think that um, that helps solve that problem. Um, and I think it helps to reduce that problem, at least. At least I, that's my optimistic view of life, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We all remain optimistic, for sure. And I agree with you. I think, you know, that empathy piece has come up so much and so many different conversations we've been having recently. And and I think that's what you do well and what AARP does so well is empathy, understanding what, what it is that issues are and then help address them. And so, right. ways. Cool. and so where are we all going in terms of the future of work? I mean, you've got that strategic foresight, the ability to see around some corners. Um, where do you see things going in, in the future of work? Well, you know, again, it's very difficult to predict the future. Um, you know, and you may see certain trends happening today that may not be there once we get out of this uh, pandemic and we get back to a version of new normal. But having said that, I do think 
there are a couple things, and we've touched on some of them. One is the concept of workplace uh, flexibility, whether it's demanded by the employee or suggested or implemented by the employer. I, I think workplace flexibility is going to be a bigger, a much bigger um, um, item in the future. Um, I think the remote, you know, the remote status, the remote working status combined with that flexibility, I think it's proven that uh, productivity, at least so far, um, can be achieved. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it will be it will be interesting to think about what happens, though, from a productivity standpoint when you do have a hybrid environment. So today. We've proven that productivity is fine, at least at ARP. We are we have not seen a drop off with everybody being remote. What happens when you have an organization that has a hybrid version? Forget the percentages of who's in the office versus out of the office, but it will that productivity remain? I hope it does. I hope the technology uh, allows us to do that, and I believe it will. But again, until we know for sure, until we actually, you know, live in it, we won't know for sure. Um, but I will say, you know, as it relates to the older worker, uh, which is what ARP, uh, you know, obviously we're very um, um, thoughtful about. I do think this concept of a multi-generational workforce um, is hit or stay. Um, and whether it's because of that technology divide has shifted uh, or decreased or lessened, um, multi-generational teams within organizations are something that are here to stay. So, I, you know, again, no one can predict the future and we have to get through this, um, but you have to keep your eye on the ball on, on certain trends and, and what's happening in your own organization and others. Well, it's heartening to hear that. And it's, and it's really great news, really great news to hear that the digital divide genera generationally is shrinking and that perhaps is accelerated as a result and effect of this situation that we're in. We're hearing from folks like yourself, CEOs, COOs, et cetera, that are all talking about the acceleration of areas in their planning that were two, three, five, seven years out that have been happening in eight weeks. And it's incredible to see and to hear that. And so what can we all learn from each other, including internationally? I mean, what can we learn here? Well, I will say, you know, it's funny about the acceleration point about, and I just want to come back to something I said. So we've been remote for whatever is 11 weeks, but we, you know, it was a Thursday afternoon and we, you know, on a Thursday, we said, next day, we're going to test our remote systems. Everybody go remote uh, on that. It was a Friday, March, whatever, 12th or 11th, whatever that Friday was. And we made the decision over the weekend to go 100% remote starting that Monday. And I think if it weren't for a couple of individuals, you know, home internet connections, we didn't miss a beat. So we made that decision, you know, very quickly um, because we had the foresight, at least the planning, thankfully, to allow us to, to do that. Um, but lessons learned going forward, whether it's, you know, domestic or international, um, we are a global environment. We, are, we do live in a global community. Uh, to your earlier point, when you opened it up, everyone is experienced for the, you know, think about it. every country, everybody, every individual is experiencing almost the same thing as it relates to this pandemic at the same time. Um, you know, it, it's just an amazing, it's amazing to be able to, to, to see this. Um, but I, it does show that you need to have some planning. You need to think about your workforce, think about your organization. How does it survive? Um, and it just takes time, effort, and it's not, you know, doing it's not fun up front. It's, I mean, you know, the, all that work is not, it's not going to generate new sales in the moment, but it's going to allow you to continue to function and continue operations in the event of, an, of a situation like this or something comparable. Well, and, and then your role, gosh, that's right, right in the middle of your job description, right? Uh, Chief operating officer. I mean, you're, you're the person that's in charge of the operations of this, of this incredible organization. And, and I want to applaud you for, for having the ability and the, the insight and the willingness to lead and to help with Joanne and, and planning and, and taking this organization forward, albeit digitally now, and to continue to be an incredible voice, honestly, for what I see 
is such an incredibly important part of this global community. The older populations, I mean, it's just profound. The, 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 the messages that have come out by the organization, the guidance, the leadership, all of these things together help form a collaborative effort that I think is really important for people to see a roadmap that, that we can get out of this. Here are lessons. And by the way, the overall lesson that I see is also what AARP has done in general to continue operations. And that lesson can be shared and is being shared obviously through this interview with other companies, NGOs, public sector to say, okay, planning is important. Partnerships are critical and not just in times of need. I mean, you have to have those relationships in place so that, that you're able to in some fashion continue. And by the way, you have an added, an added pressure, which is people look to you, you're that trusted advisor. You know, you're that trusted advisor for this older population, one of these vulnerable populations as well, as we've seen in this in this pandemic, that are looking for this information, Scott. So so personally and professionally, I, I applaud you and everything that you're doing. And I'd like to talk just a little bit about the work you've done with, for example, the World Economic Forum, the OECD, Living Learning, Earning Longer, LLEL, and Collaborative, where you share best practices. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, I think on behalf of all of us at ARP, thank you for that. Those comments about us. It's been a uh, you know a, a lot of time spent by a very large team who has put the heart and soul into making sure ARP uh, is here to, to uh, do its social mission. So thank you for that. Um, our work with the W uh, World Economic Forum and the OECD are on the living, learning, and earning longer collaborative. That's a that's a mouthful. Um, is really about working with global companies to explore the business case for age diversity and highlight promising practices from around the world. Um, so it's a lot to do with what a multi-generation workforce brings to an organization, uh, specific around recruitment and retention, uh, flexible work, all the things we've been talking about, care, caregiving benefits, um, lifelong learning, which we didn't touch on, um, is, I think, if anything, is, is one of those trends is going to um, continue to occur over the next generation. You can't always just get your education from those, you know, four years in college or wherever it, uh, period it ends. It's a lifelong event. Um, so we're excited about it. We've had a great relationship with both organizations. I think our um, report is going to be issued, I believe, in the 2021 um, World Economic Forum at Davos. So looking forward to that. You know, and, and, and again, it, it, important to note, this is this is a global, uh, the global reach and issue that you're working on. And and we've seen it again, time and time again. We saw what happened in Italy with the older population there and, and just across the world. It's been just breathtaking in, in, a, in, a, in a positive and also in a scary way on, on how this older population across the world has has endured this uh, pandemic. But yet there's the light at the end of the tunnel, which is an organization like AARP helping with so much information, so much guidance, and again, serving as that trusted advisor for so many across the planet. And so Scott, final question, mm -hmm. how, how do we embrace the future? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, question, George. I, I think um, listen, I, I think at the end of the day, I'm, I'm an optimistic in, individual, um, although my day job takes me into a lot of the details um, and nuts and bolts of running, running an organization from an operations perspective. Um, I think we uh, are, I, I'm optimistic about the future despite where we are today. Um, we've survived things in the past um, and we'll come through this hopefully a lot stronger than where we started when it began. Well, and I'm confident that that's the case because of your and Joanne's and the entire organization's leadership uh, at AARP. Thank you from IdeaGen, from all of us at IdeaGen, to you, everyone at AARP, for everything that you're doing to help folks across the planet survive, and not only survive, but thrive. Scott Frisch, EVP and COO, AARP, thank you for changing the world.
Thank you, George.